holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our songs shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Good morning. As we come together in worship, we light the Christ candle. It reminds us that the love of Christ is always present to us. God is with us. We are not alone. The compassion of Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Won't you join me now, as together we exchange the call to worship. Your response is shown in the bold print. May the God whose design dwells within us and the God whose determination dwells beyond us. Keen to marvel at the mystery we know as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, ever three and ever one. And Amen.
What's a trinity? What's a trinity? That sounds like a big question, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Big questions with a fat number. What is a trinity? That's a good question. Dr. Schnivenhausen? Yeah, a very good question. The word trinity means three in one. Try unity. Three in one. This is God. He is one. The one true God. But the Bible talks about God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and in the New Testament, God the Son. So there are three gods? No. The Bible tells us over and over that God is one. But God is made up of three persons. It's sort of like a triangle. A triangle has three sides, yet it is one triangle. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are the three sides of God. So God has parts? No. This is where it gets tricky. God the Father isn't a part of God, he's completely God. And God the Son isn't a part of God, he's completely God. The same is true for the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. All three persons are completely God. Hey friends. Hi Milo, what you doing? Oh, um, I'm looking at pictures on the internet of Roly parrots. I I'm not finding any though. C could you help me maybe type it in? My fingers aren't working very well. Roly parrots? Oh yeah, yeah. Roly parrots. You know that's what we're talking about today? Oh, Milo, I think that you might have misunderstood because today we're actually talking about the Holy Spirit. The who's he? What's it? Yeah, the Holy Spirit. You know, the Spirit of God. Uh, what's that? Well, it's actually not a what, but a who. When the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit, it says he, because the Holy Spirit is a person. Oh, so it's like one of God's good friends. Well, Milo, the Holy Spirit is God. What? I thought Jesus was God. Yeah, that's right. It might seem a little confusing at first, but God has three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all completely God, but they have different roles. Actually, I think we should call Dr. Lichtenstein for this one. Okay, it's ringing. Oh, I like this guy. Dr. L, are you there? Oh, hello there. I was just making some eggs. What can I do for you, Miss Emily? Hey, Dr. L, I was hoping that you could help us answer the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Oh, yes, the Holy Spirit. I love the Holy Spirit. Well, as a matter of fact, I think I can do that with these eggs. I have made some eggs of different ways. I've scrambled some eggs and fried some eggs, but my favorite kind of all is the hard boiled, like this one. Yes, I would just take this hard boiled egg and I will take it apart to show you what's inside. The first part is the shell on the outside, as we see here. There it is, it's hard. We crack it open and we put the shell in a little pile right here on the plate. Now, a little more shell, I think. A little more shell? Yes, we put that in the pile right there. Next part is the white. The white is the gooey part. It's white. We put that in a pile right here. And the third part is right here, this pretty yellow part in the middle. Now, We'll put that in a pile right there. Now let me ask you, how many eggs did I start with? What is just one? That is right. And how many eggs do I have now? Well, there's still just one. You just separated it now. That's right. Our God is a trinity. Tri means three. He is one God, but there are three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are all equally God, so it is important that we get to know each of them. And the Holy Spirit is very special because that is the part that lives in us. Jesus gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, God living in us. It's for everyone, all the time. I hope that helps. I'm going to eat my eggs now. Bye-bye. Yum. Good morning. Our scripture reading for today comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 
verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Here ends our gospel reading for the day. Today's text always seems like a cliche to me. Webster defines cliche as a stereotyped expression, a commonplace phrase, and it seems to me that the use of cliches is a perfect way to take any conversation from deep and holy straight to shallow and meaningless. So I'd hate to call our text today cliche, but it is John 3.16. That little verse is probably the most famous passage in the whole Bible. Okay, if not the most famous, then at least in the top five of the most well-known. Even if you're not so familiar with the Bible, if you've ever been to an NFL football game or even watched one on TV, then you've probably heard of John 3.16 because you can see it on big posters at every game. And I'll bet a whole group of you can say it from memory. Why don't you join me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. I'll tell you a little secret about preachers, okay, at least about this preacher. We hate being assigned texts like this. You know, the familiar ones that everyone knows, which come with long-standing meaning and which carry significant baggage. We don't like this particular challenge so much because it puts us right between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, we could preach a text like John 3.16 in the way that the passage is commonly interpreted and in the spirit of placards at football games and religious warnings about hell, almost cliche. On the other hand, we could dig deeper and look harder past what has become almost a meaningless recitation. But if we do that, we might uncover what appears to be an uncomfortable and inconvenient teaching of Jesus. And who wants to preach something like that? And there's the conundrum, which way to go? Go easy and transactional, or hard and transformational. Cliché or cross, you might say. Neither one is that attractive from where I stand, I have to tell you. Let's look a little closely at our text this morning. If you'd like to have a reference point, you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. We're only three chapters into John's Gospel, and already Jesus had about had it with the people with whom he was supposed to be sharing the good news. It all started out on such a high note. If you'll recall, once he'd gathered all of his disciples together, Jesus went public with his message of hope at a wedding. And it was at a wedding at Cana that he turned water into the finest wine, impressing all the guests and even his mother. And what do you know? His popularity suddenly soared. 
Of course, I don't know for sure, but I don't think that that was what Jesus expected. He started out with such enthusiasm, ready to share the transforming power of the gospel message, and he suddenly found himself being treated like the traveling sideshow in a circus. A cliche, you might say. People flocked to him, desperate to be recipients of any miracle he would perform, and Jesus quickly got tired of that. John's Gospel reports, Many believed on his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, Jesus was dubious about their belief. He knew they were so anxious to follow because they wanted him to keep performing, to keep them in unlimited bread and really good wine. And so it was that the tension between what Jesus was trying to communicate and what was really getting communicated grew more and more distinct. One evening, after a long day of overturning money changers' tables in the temple, Jesus heard a furtive knock on his door. Our text goes on to tell us that the story of Nicodemus and Jesus. Now, you don't have to be a New Testament Greek scholar to know that something is fishy here in John chapter 3. First of all, John tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Jesus had just had a very public argument with the Pharisees in the middle of the temple. So we know enough to know that it would be highly unusual for a Pharisee to come see Jesus on his own. And then John goes on to tell us that Nicodemus, who was a leader of the Pharisees, came to Jesus under the cover of darkness, sneaking around after his colleagues had turned in for the evening, desperate not to be caught. And then we hear what's on his mind. Why on earth a leader of the Pharisees would secretly go to talk with someone publicly recognized as a threat to the Pharisees' leadership, Nicodemus stammers out the thing that's been weighing on his mind. We know you're a teacher, and we know you've come from God because we've seen all these miracles you've been performing. But who are you really, and what do you mean to do with us? Nicodemus understood the preacher's dilemma, cliche or cross. And he, like this preacher, had a strong suspicion that the easy, clear-cut way just might not be the way of Jesus. When you look at the third chapter of the Gospel of John, and especially John chapter 3, verse 16, as it has commonly been interpreted, Christian faith is as simple as can be, isn't it? Faith becomes a clear-cut story that goes something like this. Once upon a time, Jesus had been sitting around in heaven resting because it was hard work helping God create all those dinosaurs and stuff. Jesus was killing time until his next mission, that is, until God sent him down to straighten things out because human beings had made a real mess of the world. Jesus was miraculously born and then wandered around Galilee for about 30 years waiting until it was time for the cross, which is the only reason he came to begin with. God sent him here to die because that's the only way you can go to heaven, which is, of course, the only point of life. Those are the rules, you see. God made them up. God loves you so much that someone has to die in order for you to be saved and that is the rule. And don't ask why God didn't just change the rules since God is in charge of everything, especially the rules, because we're not supposed to ask. That's just the way it is. So Jesus did his part as required by the rule, but you still have to do your part, which is to believe the right things about Jesus and pray the right prayer then, well, if you don't, you're going to hell when you die, and it's going to be a long, miserable eternity. And that's just the way it is, because God loves you very much. Okay, I'm being facetious, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, as even this preacher, this believer, has a soft place in her heart for John 3.16. I just suspect that this little verse in this chapter is more than transactional. It's more than cliché. I suspect the message Jesus was trying to communicate to Nicodemus was more transformational. To look deeper at the meaning of this text, to go past cliche, we have to recall that Jesus was whispering under the cover of darkness to a religious professional who had learned his whole life that faith was akin to following the rules. Transactional. 
But Jesus was talking about something bigger, deeper, and more all-encompassing, something much more difficult. Jesus was talking about setting all of our preconceived rules and boundaries, transactions and delineations, all of these rubrics that have become dangerous cliché, setting them over to the side. Jesus wanted to set them to the side and talk about something much more radical, God's deep and all-encompassing love for the whole world, a radical love to which Jesus invited us and for which he died. What would it mean if we set aside the rules we've created, the ways in which we've neatly judged others and ourselves in and out, and instead took Jesus up on his invitation to believe, to practice a kind of radical love that is the preamble to the biggest cliche of our faith, for God so loved the world. That, I would venture to say, would be most inconvenient because we modern humans don't even think that way. When we hear the word believe, we always think of two things. First, we always believe that. When we post-enlightenment, overly educated professionals talk about believing, we're talking about assembling a set of facts, something that we can factually discuss and get our brains around. I'm sure you learned the scientific method, as I did in junior high school, were the products of that human shift that happened during the Enlightenment. So we default to factual proof on every matter. Second, when we talk about believing, we assume that it involves some uncertainty. The idea that our rational minds can only take us so far, and then we have to do some kind of suspension of logic and just jump. But when Jesus and Nicodemus were having that deep middle-of-the-night discussion and talking about believing, they were thinking of something completely different than we are. For them, the act of believing was always directed toward a person. That is, I believe in you. Believing was not an intellectual exercise, but a relational engagement. Second, instead of understanding belief to be a suspension of logic like we do, belief as Jesus meant it here and in the practice of the early Christians meant to hold dear Believe, then, meant something like the English word be love, to give one's heart to. It's not transactional, and it's not cliché. It's much harder and deeper than that. It's transformational, and it might lead to a cross. Dangerous love of God for the whole world and Jesus' audacious invitation to you and me to give our hearts over to the most radical way of being human on this earth that ever, ever was. Marcus Borg, gifted theologian who died just a few years ago, has helped so many of us make this differentiation. He wrote, The Christian life is not about pleasing God, the finger shaker and judge. It's not about believing now or being good now for the sake of heaven later. It's about entering into relationship in the present, a relationship that begins to change everything now. It's so much easier to slap some paint onto a piece of poster board and drag it to the football game to keep a checklist of what you have to agree to if you want to make it in the end. It is so much harder to live as if you know that God loves you and the rest of the entire world too, and to join in with God in the difficult transformational work of healing this broken world. It's such a conundrum and not just for the preacher. Transactional or transformational? Cliche or cross? Amen.
with mine, as together we sing our closing hymn, Amazing Grace.
sung prayers prayed and the word considered our time in community today draws to a close thank you so very much for choosing to spend part of your day with us i certainly hope it was a blessing to your spirit until our paths cross again go from where we are now into what will be and take with you this blessing may the grace of god surround you the love of Christ hold you, and the Holy Spirit empower you to be all that you can, living and loving as Jesus himself. Amen. Have a great week, and I'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now.
can ever dare to dream. We are the children of heaven's creation, God's only love, each call by name. And we cry glory.